dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Dunitz, and today our guest is Dr. Ben Garber, who is a psychologist, expert consultant to family, life, and law matters, former guardian at Lydum, author and internationally acclaimed speaker. He has published hundreds of popular press and dozens of peer-reviewed articles about child and family development and divorce. His six books include Holding Tight, Letting Go, and Developmental Psychology for Family Law Professionals. In his book, Keeping Kids Out of the Middle, child psychologist Benjamin Garber offers parents a radically new perspective on co-parenting in the midst of relationship conflict and teaches co-parents how to build a consistent, healthy environment for their children through the art of scripting establishing better means of communication and communication styles, and creating parenting plans that help keep children protected. This is a guide to putting your children's needs first and giving them the safety net that they must have in order to become healthy adults who are able themselves to someday keep their own kids out of the middle. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Garber. Thank you, Yvonne. It was a wonderful introduction. Well, so deserved. And I wanted to help clear for our audience the understanding of what is a guardian ad litem. Guardian ad litem is a Latin phrase. It's used by many courts in different ways depending on jurisdiction. Here in New Hampshire, the guardian ad litem or the GAL is a professional appointed by the court to be the court's eyes and ears outside of the courtroom. So for example, in contested custody matters, when mom and dad are once married, have children, and now they're separating and divorcing, and they can't agree on how best to serve the child's needs post-separation, the court will sometimes appoint a professional to interview each parent, to visit each home, perhaps to interview the child and observe the child together with each parent. If there are other siblings or other partners, grandparents, environmental questions at, at, at large, those things need to be immediately directly investigated and then the court needs to be informed in order to make well-informed, wise, child-centered decisions about how best to serve that child's needs. And what can parents do to actually keep children out of being in the middle? That's the question that we're here about today, so let me approach it broadly. I need to be clear to begin with that we're not just talking about separation and divorce. We're talking about adults who work together to serve a child's needs. They may once have been intimate partners, they may once have been married. It could just as well be mom and her mom who are working together to raise a child. Dad and his neighbor could be boyfriend and girlfriend, could be same-sex partners. None of that is relevant. What is relevant is the idea that parents need to establish a degree of communication, a degree of consistency of parenting practices, and degree of cooperation to effectively knit together a safety net that holds the child. It's that safety net, that degree of cooperation, consistency, and communication that allows a child the freedom to feel secure and confident and to invest his or her finite energies in going out and learning and growing, exploring, and, and becoming a healthy human being his or herself. So what can enhance that consistency and communication? between the adults is what yes. you're asking, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the ingredients are common sense and obvious, and most of us get them right. They have to do with respect and patience, with personally yourself as an adult being able to regulate your own emotions and moods. A lot of us, however, have difficulty with those things by virtue of our own genetics, our own biology, our own biochemistry, or our own experience as children ourselves, when those sorts of difficulties arise, when we are dysregulated, when we have difficulties with anger expression, when we have personality 
differences or difficulties or disorders that make trusting and relating to others difficult, then kids easily, too easily in some instances, get pulled into the breach between mom and dad, or for that matter, between adult parents, uh, adult partners. And how does that play out for the children? Because nobody wins in this situation, and then the children really need an advocate for them. You've said it exactly right. As soon as the, the vocabulary of winning and losing comes into the discussion, there is only one loser, and that is the child. No one wins. Right. How does it play out for the child is the question. Painfully, although sometimes in the short term that's hard to see. Some kids get, the word in my vocabulary is triangulated, pulled into the triangle between parent A, parent B, and child in such a way that they feel prematurely promoted and, and, and proud. I'm daddy's helper. I'm mommy's best friend. Uh, I sit on the couch at night and watch the news with one parent or or the other parent comes home from a date and tells me all about it. It feels good to kids to be treated that way, but it often, perhaps even always, overloads their ability to emotionally digest that information. So, for example, many kids, five years old, 10 years old, 12, 15 years old, can sit in front of a news program and talk reasonably and try to understand, as much as, as any of us can, the horrors of the world. But those kids will then lay down to try to go to sleep and can't sleep because although intellectually they can handle that information, emotionally they can't digest it. By analogy, when parents pull kids into their conflicts, the child may be socially and intellectually prepared to talk to dad about what he thinks about mom or talk to mom about what the judge ordered or what the lawyer is doing or what the most recent court documents say too much of a burden emotionally. No child should ever be forced to choose between his or her caregivers. In the work that I do, there's lots that psychology and the law disagree about. The one thing that they always agree about is this. Children should always have the opportunity to make and maintain a healthy relationship with all of their caregivers. What happens in any way if they're feeling in conflict, if they feel unsafe or in the playing out of back and forth within the dynamics of relationship, it's hard for them to know what to communicate to each or both parents or not. Uh, it's a huge question. I, I, I've written books on the subject. Keeping kids out of the middle is exactly the answer to that question. In, in very brief overview, children respond to that experience of being triangulated into their adults, into their parents' conflict in a number of different ways. They're not mutually exclusive, and they often overlap. For example, some children become chameleon-like. They will say and do with each caregiver what they, what they read that care caregiver wants to see and hear. So they're with mom, and mom is angry at dad, and the child plays into mom's hand by saying, dad did something negative to me, dad was mean to me, dad didn't let me have dessert or let me play with my friends. And mom, of course this isn't gender specific, it's just an example, but mom in this illustration is so ready to endorse a view that dad is bad that without thinking about it, and certainly without validating it by checking in with dad, she'll endorse the child's perspective on dad as true and valid. Of course, it starts with the child just wanting to win mom's acceptance, affection, attention, but it ends up becoming a downward spiral, a self-fulfilling prophecy in which the child wants affection, says something negative about dad, mom endorses that and says, yeah, I know your dad's not a good guy, and then the child says more of the same. Of course, the same but the opposite happens with dad, where dad has a negative view of mom and the child goes to dad and says negative things about mom, dad buys into that. You can see it's like a, a piece of wood or a piece of stone with, with a wedge being driven into it. And there's a cycle to it, isn't it? it it's, a, it's a nasty, destructive, painful cycle for everybody involved. So how, do, how does one break that cycle? What, what well, are things people can do? We've only just touched the surface. Okay. Let me offer a couple of other illustrations Please. and then we'll, we'll okay. try to tackle that. 
So some children react to the experience of being polarized or triangulated into their adults, uh, into their caregivers' conflict by becoming chameleon-like. Others are prematurely promoted, as we were saying before, in one of several different ways. Some, some children are adultified. That's what do you mean like, by that? Like the child who sits on the couch with dad and watches the news late at night. They, they've been promoted to become dad's best friend or ally or, or partner in things. Uh, dad or mom or grandma or whoever the adult is, none of this is gender or generation specific, of course, takes the child on as a new best friend and an ally in, in part because that adult has lost his or her former partner and because the child is socially mature, is able to engage in a way that seems to say, I can handle it, Dad, let me in, but emotionally isn't prepared for it. The adultified child loses out on the opportunity to have a childhood in order to become the enlisting parent's partner. The parentified child, even more dramatically, is not just promoted to become a parent's ally or partner, but is promoted to become that parent's caregiver, him or herself. I have to make sure that dad takes his medicine. I have to make sure that mom doesn't drink. I have to make sure that they don't run away or hurt themselves. I have to be there to make sure that mom or dad is safe. That is a tremendous burden to anyone, especially a child. No child should have to carry that burden. In both instances, the adultified and the parentified child give up the opportunity to learn and grow and be healthy children themselves, a cost that comes back to haunt them as adults because their foundation is incomplete. One last example, and then we'll go back to your question. Yes. Some children are infantilized. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the adultified and parentified children who are prematurely promoted to serve as partners and caregivers to their parents, some children fill a needy parent's need to feel needed. I know I use the word need a lot just there. But that's true. That it yes, makes sense it makes to you. Sense. Sure. So uh, an infantilizing parent will look golden with a sick child or with a, a newborn child or a child who for one reason or another is terribly needy because that adult feels like he or she has a place in the child's life. And, and that's a sense of purpose. That's exactly what it is. The problem is, is that in the natural, healthy course of things, we all grow up. I've shared with you earlier, we've talked about this book, Holding Tight and Letting Go. Yeah. This is about taking the training wheels off, moving forward towards autonomy and independence one step at a time. The infantilizing parent can't let go, and in some very disturbed and disturbing circumstances will actually induce illness or injury or otherwise cause the child to remain needy in order to serve the adult's selfish and pathological needs. So your question earlier is, is what do we do about this? How, yeah. can, how can parents avoid or remedy these things? Once again, I fall back on common sense. It's likely that 8 out of 10, perhaps even 9 out of 10 sets of parents who separate and divorce do it right. The parents we're talking about now are in the minority. The common phrase in the, uh, among the professionals who do the work that I do is that 10% of divorcing parents consume 90% of our office time and the court's time because they have such difficulty, this is the clue, putting the child's needs first before their own adult needs. Parenting, well, I'm a parent, you're a parent, perhaps you out there, you, the viewer are a parent as well. We all know intuitively, instinctively, that our job is to put our needs second to our children's. That doesn't mean to neglect ourselves. We must take care of ourselves, but never at a cost of our children's well-being. So sure, go see a movie with your partner, take a long hot bath, do whatever it is, healthy things to refuel yourself. But you do that so that your tank is full because what we are as healthy parents is, is a fuel tank for our children. So they come to us and they cling on, they hold on tight, we refuel them in whatever way we do and then we push them off and they're refueled and they go until their tank is empty and they come back. 
these destructive and pathological dynamics arise when a parent's tank isn't full and they turn to the child to get their needs met. That is unhealthy even when children seem to enjoy it, even when children seem to take pride in it. So the children don't know better. They have no experience that is different than what they're in. So they try to make the best of the situation. And, and they're trying to survive. Yes, but even more powerfully, we are intrinsically motivated to win our caregiver's affection, attention, acceptance, approval, all of those nice things. There were psychology experiments long ago that if you took a Psych 101 class, you learned about Harry Harlow was the guy's name. He showed us that he was working with primates, of course, but we are primates. Among primates, including humans, if you're given the opportunity on the one hand to get food, on the other hand to get acceptance and affection and nurturance, we will get the minimum food necessary to stay alive and we'll spend 99% of our time getting those, those warm fuzzies. So the answer to your question, what I would say to your viewers and people who are concerned about these things, I'll say two things. One is, get your tank refueled, refilled, so that you can give to your child. But the other thing is, don't lower yourself to do what you believe your co-parenting partner is doing. Explain that, because that's a very important point. We've all heard kindergartners and third graders explain their misdeeds, rationalizing, well, he did it first, so then I did it, and as if that makes it right. But you and I know, your viewers know, that that's nonsense. That's how third graders think. Fortunately, some parents continue to think that way. So some parents will say, again, not specific to gender, but I'm going to use he and she simply for the sake of conversation. Yeah. Dad will say, well, mom is putting the kid in the middle, so i got to do the same. I have to defend myself. Here's, here's the example that comes up so often. Um, Dad says to five-year-old Billy, your mom is a schmo. And Billy goes to, to Dad and says, mom told me that you're a schmo. Well, Dad, putting his own needs first, defending himself first, says, I am not, she is. That happens on the playground among third graders. Right. The adult's role is to take a breath and step back and realize, I don't need to defend myself. I'm not on the playground. Yeah. This is about meeting my child's need. And what my child needs isn't my defense. What my child needs is an opportunity to feel loved and accepted by both of us, no matter what I think of his other parent. So the answer to, Daddy, Mommy told me you're a schmo, isn't, well, she's a bigger schmo, and it isn't, well, I'm going to tell her what, it, what's, what it's all about. The best answer to that child is, it's really hard hearing that stuff, isn't it? How does it make you feel when, when your parents argue like that? Or, well, Billy, I know it's okay for you to love both of us. Can I go on a tangent with that? Please. One of the most common questions that comes up in my office as a clinician among parents who anticipate separating and divorcing. These are healthy folks who want to do it right. Yes. It's one of my favorite things to do because so often it's broken and then they come and they say, well, how do we fix it? This is an instance where, the, where people are foresightful and mature enough to come and say, we don't want it to break. How can we make it keep working? So that question is, what do we tell the kids? They don't need to know mommy cheated on me. They don't need to know Daddy has a gambling problem. They don't need to know we're drinking or we're drugging. or They don't need that stuff. If they're going to learn that stuff, they're going to learn that stuff. It'll happen along the way, and then we'll cope with it. What they need to know ultimately is that they're going to be taken care of no matter what. So you mentioned scripting before. Right. Scripting is a form of structure. Scripting just means exactly as it sounds, laying out in advance what are the words and lines that we're going to say together so that the child gets a consistent, reassuring message. Can you give an example? I shall. The script for, we're about to break up and become two families, to the child, I don't care how old he or she is, is some version of this. Billy, once upon a time, Mommy and I met and we made you. And 
mommy loved daddy and daddy loved mommy and mommy loved Billy and daddy loved Billy. You cover all the pairs. If there's more than one child, you cover all, all the options there. Adult love can stop, and ours has. Parent-child love can't stop, and ours won't. Mommy and daddy don't love each other anymore. And that's sad. We're going to live apart. We're going to have two different houses. And you're going to get to live with both of us. But no matter what happens, mommy's always going to love you, and daddy's always going to love you, and you are always free to love both of us. Here's the nice thing about kids. If they don't get it, they'll ask again. So parents, if you get it wrong, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to go through that script again. The scripting aspect of it is important because if mommy says one thing to Billy and daddy says another thing to Billy, neither one of them is helping Billy or Sally or Susie or whoever the child is, of course. In fact, getting different messages when it's not scripted makes the problem worse. And that they, everyone agrees on the scripting. And they, in fact, do it together, and then they follow through with it. If they're able to do it together, here's the general rule in all of psychology. Structure decreases anxiety. Right. So if we can make the world predictable, if Billy knows when he's going to see mom, when he's going to see dad, if he knows what the routines are, you wake up, you, you use the bathroom, you get dressed, you eat breakfast, you get on the bus, that's a routine. If he knows what behaviors are acceptable and what the rewards for success are and what behaviors are forbidden and what the punishments for failure are, the world's predictable. He can succeed. So you're, you're making an assumption then that both parents will have the same consistent boundaries. What if they don't? Not an assumption. It's a oh, goal. Okay, so that's a goal. What if the parents are having such conflict in their communication with one another and maybe have pain in their own issues that they're going through, that they purposely do it differently in order so when the parent is with, the child is with the mother, they do things at a certain time, have structure or whatever. If they're with the father or vice versa, the other parent will specifically not do it in the same way. Remember the chameleon child we talked about exactly. a minute ago? That's why I'm bringing this up. Kids adapt. Human beings, perhaps our greatest strength is we're adaptable. We live on every continent. We live in every environment. We live in so many different cultures. Even in intact, healthy families where there's one home and there's one set of rituals and routines, kids go back and forth to church and synagogue and mosque and school and scout troop and karate dojo, and they know that the rules here are different than the rules here are different than the rules here. Kids can adapt and cope that way. But for parents who separate and are in conflict, one of the goals of healthy co-parenting, as we said at the beginning of this discussion, is consistency. So they can adapt. But why should we make them? If mom and dad can put aside their differences, can be healthy, mature adults, and come together, can find a way to communicate to say, I think you should go to bed at 9 o'clock on school nights. I think you should go to bed at 8 o'clock. All right, let's compromise. In, in both of our homes, we each have some latitude because there will be special events, but let's aim for 8.30. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that kids should go to bed at 8.30. I'm illustrating that cooperation, communication, and consistency are key. So one plug here, which has nothing to do with me or my business, just a resource out there in the world that I often recommend to people. Yes. Often enough, adults separate and can't communicate face-to-face -face as you and I are doing now because just proximity enrages them. They can still use all of those electronic media out there but sometimes they need a structured platform. Mm -hmm. www.ourfamilywizard.com. Could you say that again, please? www.ourfamilywizard, O-U-R-F-A-M-I-L-Y-W-I-Z-A-R-D.com is a wonderful resource for adults who cannot otherwise communicate, cooperate, and establish consistency to get it all out there online in a password-protected, encrypted environment so that they are comparing notes, they have some chance of compromise and cooperation, even if they can't do it like you and I are doing it right now. What other scripts do you find have been very beneficial in helping children 
looking out of a mirror. Perhaps the most important and most commonly needed script, apart from that basic introduction to why are we apart, don't make the mistake of thinking you only need to talk about why mom and dad live apart at the point of separation. That question will come up over and over again throughout the child's life. But the other one, the, the more common and needed one, occurs at transition. So if we pretend for a second you and I were once married, now we have this child, isn't it a beautiful child? This is Billy, this is Susie, I'm gonna use your mug here. Mm -hmm. Billy and Susie are with me alternate weekends and Monday and Tuesday until after school on Tuesday and then with you Tuesday and Wednesday and alternate Fridays and weekends. The, the court has given us a very structured schedule. But Tuesday after school or Tuesday evening or Friday evening or whenever the transition occurs, you bring the kids to me or I bring the kids to you or for enough people out there, they meet in the parking lot at Shaw's or they meet at the police station. The script makes that face-to-face -face encounter as minimally emotionally loaded for the child as possible. At that point of transition, mom and dad should not be saying anything of substance. That is not when the child support check is exchanged. That is not when the dentist's appointment is announced. That's certainly not when we start talking about my lawyer said and your lawyer said and see you in court, darn it, fist slam, foot stomp. That's not what should happen there. That's harmful. Our kids read our emotions more quickly than they understand our words. Infants get it. Your heart is beating quicker. Your palms are, are cold and sweaty. They hear your rapid and shallow breathing. All of our kids understand our emotions first and foremost. So we script those encounters. So what does that look like? It's really obvious. And it's one of the only times I'll ever recommend that people should lie. I don't like lying, but sometimes it's necessary goes like this. Billy and Susie are with me. You're meeting us. We're in the parking lot at Market Basket. Billy, there's mom. Let's get out of the car and say hi. Hi, Yvonne. Nice to see you. How are you? Yvonne responds, hi, Ben. Nice to see you. I'm fine, thanks. And then Yvonne turns to the kids and says, hi, Billy. Hi, Susie. Come on, guys. Let's go. Say goodbye to your dad. See you, kids. Have a good time with your mom. Bye. Off you go entire thing. It's fewer than 60 seconds. We perhaps made eye contact, we smiled, and we told a whole bunch of lies because I'm not fine, I'm not happy to see you. And true, I did just say kids will read our emotions and if inside I'm seething, that's going to confuse them. But I'd far rather confuse them in that way and make the transition smooth and clear and simple than greet you in the parking lot and start cussing you out. Exactly. Which I'm sorry to say, many of your viewers have seen, Kids live through that all the time. They do it. And how does it come out in their lives? <laughs> That's a huge question. We need a whole different hour on that subject. I think people subject. need to know because it does damaging things to them, doesn't exactly it? Exactly right. Exactly right. So have you ever played Jenga? I actually haven't. Oh, really? Well, no. Okay. Do you know what it is? No. Huh. <laughs> is your, that the one with the blocks? Yes, yes. Okay. Blocks are stacked up, and, right. and so there's a I've couple on the bottom, this. and then they're crossed all the way, and there's a tower, and you're supposed yep. to take pieces out. Mom and Dad are the bottom-most blocks on that tower. Or leave Jenga aside. Think of any skyscraper, New York City, tall building. Right. There's a foundation. Of course. If that foundation, I'm going to use my hands yep. again, if the foundation is, is, is built solid, is sound, then you can be on the 100th story, and you can be safe. But if there's a tremor in the foundation, just right. a little rattle. Everything comes down. Well, not yet. Mm -hmm. Just a rattle in the foundation, then on the hundredth story, you're swaying like right. this. Yes. And if there's a crack or there's a flaw or, goodness, if there's some catastrophe in the foundation, then it all comes down. So the impact, sometimes short-term, often long-term, and not, not visible immediately, our flaws are are failures in the child's sense of self, and the child's ability to relate to others, and the child's ability to trust. Those things are hard to see because we have to wait 10 and 20 years, 30 years sometimes to see them. Sometimes they come out as second generation divorce and marital conflict or adult intimate conflict. Sometimes they come out as failures in parenting because many children 
who feel like they have ne were never parented themselves. Mm -hmm. Children who were adultified and parentified as children never had the opportunity to be children, and then they grow up and they want their children to parent them. I was never a child. Now you're going to let me be one. The more immediate implications are, are more obvious. When stress hits, whatever the cause, start of the school year. Grandma is ill. Uh, we're moving. A uh, newborn sibling comes into the home. Any sort of stress could be a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Or loss of a job. It all trickles down. Mm -hmm. Kids show us their stress by changes in their characteristic behavior and relationships. So a child who has been toilet trained for years might start having accidents. Mm -hmm. A child who's been sleeping through the night and getting in bed without great difficulties suddenly is resisting going to bed or being apart. A child who's gone to school and done fine, grades drop. They become clingy and refuse to get on the bus. A child who's been eating fine and gaining weight appropriately starts to hoard food or develops an eating disorder. Any aspect of childhood, biological, human functioning can fall backwards. So I think we said this once before, you and I. If development is climbing a flight of stairs one step at a time when stress hits, yeah. the first thing you do is you take a step back down that staircase. If you see your child taking a step down that flight of stairs, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're reacting to co-parental conflict, but probably they're reacting to some stress. And the first step, after you've checked with the pediatrician to make sure that they're physically healthy, is to look around and say, what's changed? What might they be responding to? To you and I, it might be nothing. To them, it could be huge. Absolutely, and affect them in a multitude of ways. Correct. Things that we can do to help solidify a child's self-esteem. Wow. I, How can we I, build I their self-esteem? That makes it an easier way to approach well, it. It's just such a huge question. It's a really important question. Um, I, I go back to structure. It's not necessarily the first best answer, but it's part of the answer. I'm sorry I didn't bring you new with me. I should have thought, but I carry in the trunk of my car an anchor uh -huh. with a rope because okay. I do a fair number of presentations to groups. And, and, and with that anchor, what I try to communicate to parents is, is the idea that this is you. You're that anchor. And the child goes out on the rope to a point where either you, the parent, gets nervous and you reel them back in, or the child, him or herself, gets nervous, anxious, scared, tired, hurt, and they come back in. So the experience is the source of self-esteem and confidence is knowing that there is that anchor there. That emotional foundation. Yeah, so earlier we referred to uh, the, the metaphor of a fuel tank. Mm -hmm. um, I don't and I wouldn't recommend it, but you can imagine that in some places in the world it's, it's good, a good idea to carry around one of those red gas cans in the back of your car because gas stations are few and far between. Well, we teach kids that I am the source of your emotional fuel. And then as they grow, they learn to carry around their own little metaphorical red gas cans. The toddler has a pacifier or a blankie or a stuffed animal. You and I, we have symbols of the things that make us emotionally secure. Our anchors, pictures on our phone or in our wallets or the rings that tie us to the people that we care about, a piece of jewelry. If if under worst case circumstances you were stuck in an elevator or in a terrorist environment or some sort of a terrifying situation, you would reach out to the people who are your emotional anchors. And they would reassure you and your self-esteem would be shored up. That's what we do for kids. Structure, making the world predictable and making your yourself predictable, available, serving as an anchor to children. That's what does it. That's abstract. Let's make it very concrete. Is the answer to giving children positive self-esteem, complimenting them lavishly and often? Don't go overboard. Kids need and want and deserve realistic feedback within the scope of their ability to cope. So we applaud their efforts no matter the outcome. Love that you tried. That's a great effort. Boy, you're holding that crayon really well. Look at how you're riding that two-wheeler. 
And then when they get it right, we say, good job, high five, knuckle bump, all of those very cool means of applauding our kids. But they know when the, when the praise is empty and false and it loses its meaning if every single test quiz paper project creation that comes home seems to get an A+. Plus. So we give them realistic feedback cautiously and we help them along the way learn how to manage that feedback and the, and the criticism that goes with it. I often talk to parents about process versus product. Process is the effort that's made. Good job for trying, Billy. I'm really proud of you for making that effort. Product is the outcome. I take the position that often enough, as assuming that people are safe, that we should leave teaching to the teachers. We all grow up way too quickly, Yvonne. Our kids are adults and off in the world and away from us much too soon. You and I perhaps are old enough, sorry to say that on TV here, to remember <laughs> the Jim Croce song. Um, my child arrived the other day, Cats in the Cradle was Cats the title. The yeah, if you're out there and you've never heard that song, Google it, YouTube it, whatever the media is these days, go listen to it because Jim Croce was right. We're too busy as young adults and parents to pay attention to our kids, and then by the time we have the maturity to slow down and pay attention to them, they're gone. Right. And they're off doing their thing. They need us now. They need to enjoy the process of being with us, quite apart from the product. Do a jigsaw puzzle together. Who cares if you lose a piece? Who cares if the pieces go together? It's the act of doing it that matters. Eat dinner backwards. Eat soup holding the spoon backwards. Build a castle out of cardboard boxes. It doesn't matter if it falls apart. Be in your children's lives. And I say it that way quite purposefully because so many parents that I see make the mistake of forcing children to enter into their adult lives. Billy, look at the news. Sally, did you hear about my work? Here's who I'm dating. Here's, you know, I want to talk to you about the lawn and the bills and the taxes. They don't care. And if they seem to care, it's only because they want your time and attention. Put that all away. So what would you tell people to do? If they had a few things to do that you think would be the most important things to do with their children in order to solidify that foundation, that emotional foundation, what would it be from your perspective and your knowledge and the experience of the work that you do? I do not mean to say that single parents can't do the job. I know amazing single parents. But my first answer to your question is that the most important thing to shore up a child's self-esteem, security, and confidence is to do that co-parenting thing that we've been talking about. To do this. Right. And to make a commitment for the sake of the child. To put the child's needs first before yeah. your own. To communicate, to cooperate, and to establish that co-parenting consistency. But perhaps you were asking more directly from the adult to the child what to do. As I just said, I, I want parents to be in their child's world without intruding. Kids need a degree of privacy within the limits of safety. But if you don't know who your teenage daughter's favorite music group is, or the brand name of the clothes that he or she prefers, or the teacher's names or the friend's names, and you don't know that this, that teddy bear goes on that shelf in that room, dad, mom, it's time to learn. Those things communicate to our kids that their world is important, and by extension, they are important. Kids aren't, I don't know how to say it clearly. Because our worlds seem to us to be so sophisticated and important and mature, that doesn't mean that their worlds aren't. From their perspective, a child's worlds and worries and thoughts and concerns and ambitions are incredibly important. And so what I'm trying to communicate, however poorly, Yvonne, is that it's important for us parents to enter their worlds, to know about their goals and ambitions and worries and fears and hopes and desires, and to meet them on that level and to support them in those goals. Those are the anchors of their self-esteem. And that priority is to occur regardless if you are married and well in that relationship, as well as if you're in conflict or separated or divorced. Each needs to know. 
I said to you as we were talking about what we we're going to talk about this hour, mm -hmm. quite simply and perhaps unprofessionally, you don't have to be married to screw up your kids. And you can divorce and have healthy kids. The majority of people do it. And the goal is to have healthy kids. The goal is to have healthy kids, absolutely. It, it doesn't matter if you're a single parent. It doesn't matter if you're a same-sex parent. It doesn't matter if you're an intergenerational parent. It doesn't matter if your co-parent or parents live in Asia. You don't need to live together. You don't need to be the same generation. You certainly don't need to marry to either screw up your kids or to help them be healthy and well and to give them the opportunity, the model, and your permission to go on to raise healthy children themselves. So get to know the children in the best way possible. Be consistent. What about prolonged conflict? What happens to children and what needs to be done for the sake of the Are child? you talking about adult conflict? Yes. Prolonged and severe. I yes. mean, uh, uh, trauma has its echoes through our lives for a very long time. So prolonged is just one variable. A child who wakes up in a war zone every morning. Right. Well, let, let's do it this way. Uh, if you can see the cup here, this is how much energy a child has. Or you or I. We right. all have a finite amount of emotional energy. That's true. If you wake up in a home that's highly conflicted or lacks structure or is entirely unpredictable for one reason or another, then more and more and more of this finite energy has to be absorbed with the basics of who's going to be at the breakfast table? Will there be breakfast at the breakfast table? Do I go to school today? Who's going to meet me after school? Will anybody meet me after school? The, the more a child's world is unpredictable and conflicted, the longer it's conflicted, the less of this finite energy is available for learning and growing and laughing and loving and healthy stuff. So this is going to come out in a variety of ways, probably in school and other places the child goes. Absolutely. Can I tell you why I first got into this work with Please. children whose parents are highly conflicted? A million years ago, working in an outpatient clinic, I wasn't in charge of who got into my office. There was a receptionist, an intake coordinator. And so I'd get a file in front of me, a new family, and, and it was looking like eight out of every 10 referrals to my office as a child clinician were children diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Well, ADD and ADHD are real things. I am not questioning that at all. And we can talk about what that means. But it is not the case that 80% of the next generation has it. On the surface of the thing, if your finite energy is being absorbed by conflict and chaos in your home, then you sit down in math class, you're not going to be able to pay really close attention. You don't care. You're exhausted. You're distracted. Who's going to care about 5 times 5 equals 25 or ABC or the capital of Yugoslavia if in the back of your mind it's go you're thinking about, is dad going to beat up mom tonight when I get home? Right. Or whose home am I even going to? So if you look beyond the surface of the thing. Mm -hmm. About half of those eight out of 10 kids, maybe four out of every 10 kids, regardless of the legal status of their adult's relationship, come out of conflict and chaos in their home. And if you can help the family, not label the child as having an illness, but help the family settle the, the chaos, establish structure, find a way to meet the child's needs, all of a sudden, the thing that we were ready to medicate and give an IEP to and a 504 plan to and to diagnose with a mental illness, the thing that we would otherwise have called attention deficit disorder, disappears. And real ADD, I'll say again, it does exist. I'm not questioning that. But real ADD, those two or three or four kids out of ten, you can't fix that that way. You can help it other ways follow what I'm saying? I do very much so. So the question is when you say you can't fix that that way, related to the other things that you were talking about, it, it would mean that the child's community, not only the community and the inner life of what they have, but the outer circle that occurs between the relatives and everybody else, and then the outer circle that extends even more to the school, mm -hmm. will be picking up on the dynamics and things that they're witnessing in. How can they help? How can they help that child? And where are the boundaries of what one can do to literally have everybody, as you said, step back, focus on the child, and do what's best for the child? 
I'm going to try to answer your question, but I want to make sure that we're being clear. Please. If a child is in school at any grade right. and appears distracted, impulsive, right. off task, mm -hmm. the easy thing to do is to fill out a questionnaire describing the superficial behavior see if those answers meet diagnostic criteria for attention deficit disorder, and then on that basis alone, recommend therapy or medication or intervention at school. Some of those kids genuinely have a neurobiological difference that we call ADD or ADHD. But some of those kids, maybe as many as half of them, don't have that difference and get to that superficial presentation because of chaos and conflict at home. So you're asking a very astute question, not only at the level of family. I think you described the bullseye. The child is the, is the center. Correct. But on that target, there's another ring around the child that is right. family. And there's another ring around the family that is community. Right. That might be church, synagogue, or mosque. It might be right. neighborhood. It might be something of the sort. And then there's neighborhood and state and country and world. And right. So how can we get everyone on the page to help that child? Right. I wish I had a single best answer there. I can offer some clues, but you and I and our viewers and our colleagues out there, we have to put our heads together and think proactively toward health rather than toward illness to try to solve this problem. Exactly. Here's some clues. Yes. Our mental health service provision network is an awkward phrase, but by that I mean everyone in and out of schools, in and out of the community, in and out of private practice, who intends directly or otherwise to serve the mental health needs of children, yes. needs to step away from the medical model of individual diagnosis to understand that you can't get appendicitis because mom and dad are in conflict, but you can get depression or you can look like you have attention deficit disorder or anxiety disorder, or you pick it, mental health difficulties can be caused by and must be understood within the context of relationships. And so my practice in my office here in Nashua and the practice among my colleagues whom I enjoy working with and whom I respect most dearly, have the wisdom to look at the family system and the community structure as it bears on the child's functioning. I'll just throw in there briefly, although I'm far from an expert on the subject, that culture and language are parts of that formula, that different cultures, different languages do things differently. And we need to understand a child's behavior within those variables as well. The larger culture, perhaps at the level of the school district or the particular school, needs to be really savvy and wise and patient, not to jump on the idea that Billy is necessarily having a problem only, though it may be true that Billy or Sally or Susie is having a problem, but that that problem may be part of a larger problem. It gets complicated because our schools aren't there to change our families I hope there are people out there who would argue that, but on the surface of things, our schools are there to educate our kids. But what if you can't educate a kid because there's a family problem? Where does that go? Exactly. We don't have a good answer for that. So maybe we can all agree that the solution has to come at the level of concerned communities responding to concerned communities, that we all need to be involved in the process. There are a lot of families whose conflict is easily and often put off on their child. There are a lot of parents out there, I'm sorry to say, well, that's not fair. There are parents out there, perhaps a lot isn't saying it accurately. There are parents out there who would just as soon have their boy or their son or daughter be medicated and diagnosed with ADD rather than talk about how mom and dad are in a fist fight every night and the child's not sleeping because he's worried about a parent drinking or violence in the home. We can't endure that. No. We must help our children. We must put their needs first. 
We absolutely must. So in order to do that, I know that you wrote this book, Keeping Kids Out of the Middle. And in that book, if you were to summarize, what are the most important points that people would get from this book that could help them in doing just that, keeping kids out of the middle and healthfully co-parenting together? We, we've said it here in this hour. The first and most important point is the title, that we must put our children's, children's needs first before our own. We must put our needs second to theirs. And in the process of doing those things, we must keep them out of the middle. Every child has the right, and we have the responsibility to fulfill the right to be a kid. Beyond that, we've talked about structure in the form of limits with associated consequences, emphasizing positives and rewards for successes. We've talked about structure in the form of boundaries that define different environments. This is dad's house. This is mom's house. When you're in mom's house, look around you, Billy. The, the walls are yellow. It must be mom's house. The rules here are mom's rules. Same thing in dad's house, different environment. Those are boundaries, respecting one another's boundaries, teaching children about boundaries, and about rituals that make time predictable. First A, and then B, and then C. Wake up, and bathroom, and get dressed, and eat breakfast. Come home, have a snack, do your homework, and then supper. Take a bath, say your prayers, get in bed, go to sleep. See dad Monday, Tuesday, see mom Wednesday, Thursday, whatever the schedule is. When, the, when, when structure is known, anxiety is diminished, that amount of energy that must be devoted to coping with home is reduced, and the child has that much more energy for learning and growing and growing into a healthy human being. That really kind of puts it all together. And again, reminding people about what to do when there is prolonged conflict related to the child and what needs to be done in focusing on the child. Of course. Perhaps what, what you're leading me toward is how important it is for adults to get their own needs met. Yes. More than just taking a yoga class or having a warm bath or going for a walk, there are resources out there in the community. Uh, go to your church, synagogue, or mosque and seek support from your clergy person. Get exercise. Um, get into counseling or psychotherapy, couples therapy, marital therapy, family therapy. Therapy doesn't mean illness. Therapy means you're wise enough and mature enough to ask for help. No one can live this very difficult life unassisted. We are richer for the experience of sharing our experience with others. You said before about mental health, and it's very true that there truly isn't health without good mental health as well as physical health. It's a combination of that. It's all the same thing. It is all the same thing. So what else would you recommend to people? You've covered a lot here today. But again, summarizing some of the best ways for them to lead healthy lives in order to keep their child out of the middle and help them to be healthy children. Maybe what we can conclude with is a correction on a long-standing and I think misunderstood saying. One of our political candidates has been fond of saying it recently, but it's an old African proverb or aphorism. The way that it's often repeated is, it takes a village to raise a child. It's a true statement, but it's not the whole statement takes villagers who can communicate, cooperate, and establish consistency to raise a healthy child. That's our goal together. Regardless of the state of our marriage, the legal relationship between us, the geography, or the generation that we share, or our generations apart, our goal is to raise healthy children so that they can grow up and our world can be healthier for it. Absolutely. And when there are additional challenges that occur, I know some people, they have their, what is it called, their divorce decree, and it says what is happening related to the parent and issues and things like that. And then you may have a particular partner that doesn't follow yeah. what has been said. What do you recommend related to that conflict? There is such a thing as a divorce decree, but I think you're referring to what's called in New Hampshire a parenting plan. Yes. If you imagine a spectrum, a continuum that goes from parents who can sit down and put their needs second, put the child's needs first, and 
work out their disagreements at one end of the continuum to parents who can't even be on the same planet together, it right. seems. These folks will take care of themselves because they'll go sit at Panera or Starbucks or the, the local bookstore and they'll talk it out and they'll settle it and it'll be done. These parents probably have to go back to court over and over again. We call them revolving door litigants because no one but a judge in a black robe with a big, big gavel with police officers and court clerks standing by can make them do anything. But short of that extreme, I would have your viewers learn about something called parenting coordination. Parenting coordinator is a child-centered professional appointed by the court to meet with parents to settle conflicts within the parameters of the existing parenting plan and to help keep them out of court, to save them the time and expense of that process. So how can people get in touch with someone like that? www.pcanh.org. That's P-C-A-N-H. Parenting Coordinators Association of New Hampshire. Or reach me. I'd be glad to How help people. How can they people. reach you? Glad to help people find resources. My website is www.healthyparent.com. H-E-A-L-T-H-Y-P-A-R-E-N-T, -E which a child pointed out to me recently also spells heal thy parent. Isn't that something? It turned out And that, that is a beautiful thing that a child pointed that out to you. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Oh, I thank you so much for everything that we covered today. This is very, very helpful because it's so important for us to have healthy children. And it's so important for all of us to be healthy. But if we do not have healthy children, they will not become healthy adults. They exactly won't know right. what it is to become healthy adults. They won't have the role models to do it. And our parents and our uh, extended families and our friends and and the community members, as you say, all play a part in helping us all to remember that our health is critically important. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you, Yvonne. We welcome you in the future, and we say goodbye to our, our listeners, and we look forward to seeing you again. Take care.